Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Katarina Tillmans, the co-president of Games for Change Europe. Hello and welcome. It's an incredible honor to be part of this very inspiring event here in the US. Um, well, I want to take this moment to share a couple of thoughts with you and our activities back in Europe. And um, we are quite a baby in Europe still. So Games for Change here is in its 11th year. And in Europe, we started two years ago by uh, really founding um, Games for Change as an organization. In Europe, we are thinking a lot about the aesthetical challenges that come with, with transformational game design. And we are currently building a community and are also hosting a festival, our second festival this June. It will take in lovely Paris. And this is an extended invitation to all of you. If you happen to be in Paris in the nicest time of the year, mid-June, please come and join us and join the conversation over in Europe. So part of our activities in Europe is to um, support students to think early on about transformational game design, how to change society for the better through the power of their medium. And so we initiated a, a competition or a challenge for students l earlier last year, uh, together with our partner Autodesk, to really kind of kickstart the conversation among students about this. And this competition will still run for another month, so everybody who's interested in looking into it, into who maybe has already a working prototype for a social impact game uh, at hand, please go to our website. It's uh, www.gamesforchangeeurope.eu and uh, apply and register for the competition. Part of this competition is also that the review process is, is going through a really amazing jury. And uh, it's my great honor to introduce Noah Falstein as part of this year's jury to our Games for Change challenge. Noah is been, has been active in the games industry for, well, from my point of view, forever, which is the early 80s. So he has been a game designer and producer and uh, was really an early thinker about what can games be beyond entertainment without losing the entertainment factor, of course. With his company, The Inspiracy, he has been working in this field on different topics from corporate games to serious gaming. And, uh, well, he has been a great supporter for the Games for Change movement ever since. So... Um, I'm really happy to announce um, Noah Falstein, game design, chief game designer at Google. Welcome. Okay, hello everybody. Um, boy, nice house here. Uh, so this, is, uh, this has been very exciting. Um, Jane's a tough act to follow, but I'm, I'm happy to say a lot of what she said I think will resonate with what I'm about to say. Uh, in fact, she gave you a view of the future, and as a lot of storytelling does, you know, we, we start with an exciting future, and then we go back into the past and give you a little flashback to show you how we got there. So I'm going to do some of that and then perhaps move ahead a bit. Um, if we could bring up my slides here. Uh oh Well, sometimes uh, things take a little bit longer to change. Um, <laughs> we're getting there. Um, that's the wrong view. I think I need to switch out here. Let me try that again. Sorry about this, folks. I think I'm seeing the uh, slides on my computer and the uh, computer version up on the big screen there. So hopefully we can get this sorted out. And I'm sorry to say that I'm not a Macintosh expert. So um,
you why we're sending signal. Well, I think we saw the signal there, but it had it swapped with uh, when I. Did it present the presentation before? So we had the. This should be showing up over there instead. So this fits in very well with my talk about how technology has advanced rapidly over the last 30 years. <laughs> Some things also remain the same. Um, This all was working uh, just an hour ago. Oh, that's, well, at least we've got the right display there. The computer knows that it's going out. So let's see. Um, well, while we're trying to work out the technical details, let me uh, talk a little bit about, there we go, about some of the things that uh, uh, Jane's talk was reminding me of that game designers, I think, all have a very similar point of view. There's uh, almost a, a personality type, I think, if you're a game designer. And when Jane was talking about using jelly beans to uh, essentially uh, concoct a, a recipe from, from these ingredients that really resonated, a lot of the game designers I know are amateur or even professional cooks and are very interested in taking these different ingredients. Um, well, we're moving somewhere. Um, taking these different ingredients and uh, figuring out how to design them and create them and, and concoct something new. And if you think about it, uh, game design is a little bit like writing recipes. There, there we go. I think we need the uh, other one of those. Great. Um, in that. Uh, a game design is followed by people um, as, as we go ahead. <laughs> getting warmer, getting warmer. There All right. Go. Excellent. Okay. Sorry for those delays. Thanks, everybody, for waiting. So anyway, uh, as I say, game designers are a little bit like chefs, uh, or at least like uh, recipe writers, and then the team executes on it. And, and speaking of that, uh, may I ask how many people here are game developers or aspiring game developers in the audience? Excellent. All right. A good majority of you. So I'm going to focus on that quite a bit here, because I really think that uh, you know, I'm ex excited to see the future that Jane was talking about, the past that I'll talk about, and the future that I, I hope to see is really going to be built by, by people like you. So. Hopefully, we can move forward with that. So as I mentioned, I've been a game designer, uh, and that really is, is more of a mental state in some ways than just a profession. Uh, I've been doing that uh, in some ways uh, professionally since 1980, but when I was five years old, I was starting to make games out of cardboard, and it really uh, is something I share with a lot of my fellow game designers, that it just seems to be part of the blood at some level. But I'm also very interested in evolution, and that's going to be a theme of the talk as we go forward. I spent uh, fairly neat parts of my career, the first 17 years or so, working for a number of small companies like Lucasfilm Games, went on to become LucasArts, and uh, the 3DO company that did the first CD-ROM-based uh, game system, game console, and uh, DreamWorks Interactive. And then another 17 years as a freelancer, working on a variety of projects, and increasingly starting a few years into that freelancing time, for what I was starting to call then serious games, and some of which could certainly be termed games for change as well, and contributed to quite a wide range because I love variety, and uh, this is an industry, thank thankfully, where you can find quite a bit of variety. And in the last year, I've been at Google. Uh, I unfortunately can't talk a lot about what I'm doing, but apropos of games for change, I got authorization to, to mention that I've been 
talking to and doing some planning with the Google Giving, uh, Google.org group, and they're very interested in games and the potential that games have to help change the world in positive ways. So hopefully something will uh, come of that as well, but no uh, formal announcements at all. Um, my personal view, because of starting back in 1980, has really been shaped by the way technology has changed. That I actually had email in college. Uh, it was a very early system, and it was only email within the, uh, the colleges that were in our immediate area. And likewise, when I went to my first company, we had an email system that worked within the company, but not for sending email to anyone else. But very quickly, in fact, when I started Lucasfilm, we started to get on Usenet that was uh, some of the very early uh, internet email-based things. And we would see things like this. There would be, this would be a map of all the different computers that were connected together. And if you wanted to send email to someone else, you had to manually decide which computer one by one and add exclamation points and stick your name at the very end, your email address at the very end. So uh, it was pretty laborious. We were always excited when a new Byte magazine would come out with a new map to see if there was a quicker way to get your message across the country or around the world. So that's the way things were. We had cell phones starting around the same time, but they looked kind of like that, and they only did voice and not very well. And in a, you know, another example of things that don't change, the battery didn't last very long. Um, in fact, one of the things I find interesting is that when I use my phone now, you know, just the, the phone in my pocket is so much more powerful than mainframe computers were at that time. And yet, I don't really use it for, for voice calls very often. It's not really even in the top five of the, the uses I have. And that's been pretty interesting to see that sometimes technology invented for one thing gets used for something completely different, which, of course, is partly why we're all here. Uh, another thing we did at Lucasfilm was a very early game called Habitat that was really the very first graphic uh, massively multiplayer online game. Massively meaning we had about 250 people, but that was a pretty huge number for the time. And, brought uh, Quantum Link, the system we were on, to its knees, which then later went on to become America Online. So uh, make of that what you will. Um, graphics on the Commodore 64 were pretty limited, but graphics for computers were really driving a lot of the graphic cards and hence uh, the technological changes that later would make the World Wide Web possible and certainly much more impressive uh, graphic games like Ultima Online that still persist to today and uh, you know, following on with, with other high-tech, uh, very impressive games. And then you know, even 10 years after that, smartphones came, smartphones came in. Now we're talking about wearables. Jane did a great job of giving you an overview of some of the exciting new technologies, so that's going to save me some time here. Uh, but evolution, natural and technological, tend to go in cycles. And they tend to have both extinctions, where you know, things are, are going up for a while, and then suddenly there's a fall, and then they start to rise again. But also explosions, where things may be going along in status quo, and suddenly takes off for no apparent reason. Those things happen in technology as well as uh, nature. But let me talk about nature for a while. A lot of people think of, when I talk about cycles and extinctions, I bet a lot of you were thinking of the uh, comet hitting the Earth or an asteroid and wiping out the dinosaurs 65 million years ago. That's the, the sort of cliche that we all come to. But something uh, even more interesting in some ways happened 540 million years ago was something called the Cambrian Explosion, where first there had been single cellular life for a very long time, and then almost out of nowhere, as soon as multicellular life started to catch on, it went into this profusion of these weird forms, uh, all in the sea at that point, but all sorts of almost science fictional crazy uh, creatures that popped up. And that kind of explosion, I think, is something that we're experiencing today. And Jane talked pretty eloquently about all the new things that are out there. I'll go over that a bit as well. But there are these rises and falls of eras in nature, and of course also in games and game systems. And in my years in the, the games industry, I've seen a lot of things go up and down more recently. There has been the social uh, uh, boom that has, has fallen off quite a bit for games on social networks. Uh, but then indies have come on strong. Uh, mobile is growing. But those things, you know, nothing ever lasts. That's one of the things to look at both in the natural world and the technological world. So the question is, what will be coming next? And for Games for Change, we've already had a few cycles in terms of what those names are, that, you know, these are our names that have come and gone or are still here, but 
Uh, nobody really knows. You know, names are, I think, much less important than what you actually do with the games and your procedures, but it shows that in everything there are cycles and these things go up and down. Which brings us to uh, my first bit of uh, uh, another bit of a cliche, but it's um, sort of a well-known one that the Chinese character for a crisis is a mix of the characters for danger and opportunity. That also explains the time we're going through right now. It's a crisis and not necessarily uniformly a danger and opportunity for everyone. Uh, for example, the danger is particularly important for those who are very slow to change. Um, you end up like our, our friend here who's out at the Google main campus. And there's a lot of discussion about whether in the entertainment industry we're in the last big console cycle, whether PS4 and Xbox One are going to be some of the, the last big consoles we see with uh, wearables and you know, mobile uh, certainly growing in importance, micro consoles sort of nibbling away from the bottom, and pretty soon nothing but bones are left. Uh, as I said, the social game uh, has come and peaked, although it could certainly come back and peak again. Uh, we also have mobile costs climbing, so even though mobile is spreading very widely, which is really promising, the cost to make a high quality game and particularly a sort of a triple A title for mobile is going up and up and it's put it out of the range of a lot of small indies and student groups certainly. There's also been a lot of disruption in business models. Free to play, uh, it came out of nowhere and those of us in the games industry were kind of shocked that you could have hundreds of millions of people playing a game, just those numbers alone were, were incredible, but the fact that less than 5% or even sometimes less than 1% of the people were actually paying for it and it was really profitable was also pretty amazing. Of course, when you think about that, a million play, paying customers out of 100 million people, that's still a mil million paying customers and that's not bad. And then uh, finally here, there's this ever-increasing choice of hardware. And again, Jane hit on a lot of the stuff that's out there, and I'm sure you've been following the news, know what's out there right now. So where's the opportunity in this? A lot of scary stuff, not knowing where to go. Well, let's go over some of the positive things. We've never really been in a more lucrative time. I, I think that it's amazing how much money is uh, coming out of the games industry, and it's also being very well financed. Now, I know when you're actually looking for money for your title, it always feels like there's never enough for you, it's never enough out there. But this has become easier and easier over time, just as people have realized that you need to take games seriously. And I mean that in, in all senses of the word. It's also been never more popular and widespread, largely to the profusion of these incredibly powerful mobile platforms that we now carry in our pockets or have in our living rooms in, in tablet form. And uh, it's global, it's reaching people from all ages, you know, from little kids playing on tablets where we never expected the tablets would be such a huge market for two-year-olds, to uh, aging adults using games to help their brains. Um, in fact, uh, a colleague, uh, Dr. Adam Ghazali, is, is speaking later this afternoon, and I've got some slides coming up uh, from uh, his work that show how it's reaching older people as well. And that's also apropos because it's never been more consequential, and that's where games for change and serious games in general, I think, come in, that games are really changing the world in really exciting ways, in very fundamental, important ways, helping us be better as human beings, helping us do our jobs better, helping us connect with other people around the world and in justice. You know, it's really uh, quite an amazing time that way. This is uh, one of the uh, EEGs from Adam's lab, and it shows how connected we are. We're connecting in many different ways. Brain monitors, uh, in fact, not only seeking signals in the brain, but sometimes actually activating the brain with electrical uh, impulses, very science fictional stuff. And we're getting closer and closer to some of the science fictional futures that way. But also we're on just a lot of basic devices and screens. And the fact is that increasingly, certainly in the first world, people have multiple screens handy at any one time. I've got two phones with me and, and uh, a bunch of tablets at home. And people are starting to watch television and have their phone or tablet with them at all times. And it's really creating new opportunities for us to figure out how to use that kind of dynamic in such a way to enrich people's lives and not simply give you more diversion. Uh, and uh, perhaps most consequential is that games have never really been as well analyzed as they are now. 
Universities are studying games at all levels. And particularly in neuroscience, this is an area that I find in incredibly exciting because it's, it's very synergistic in, in the uh, non-cliched form of that word in that the neuroscientists want to do tests and they need something that is exciting and engaging that can get people thinking. And we in the games industry want to find out what's going on in people's brains while they're playing games. How can we get them more engaged? It's really a, a great uh, uh, feedback loop between these two areas here. So how do you make best use of these? Well, the simple formula is to do what the mammals did after the fall of design, uh, the dinosaurs. You want to survive and thrive. And you really have to uh, spread into new niches, find new areas. And being flexible is constantly the best way to go. That I know it's uh, uh, an oversimplification. But flexibility, and I thought some of what Jane talked about earlier is a great way to demonstrate a range of how many different things are possible, that the same building blocks can be combined in many, many different ways. You know, and again, with that cooking analogy, those same ingredients under the, the guise of a, uh, under the, the hands of a master chef can be turned into many different types of meals with a wide range of flavors. And we're looking at a time where we've got more possibilities that way than we ever had before. Something to keep in mind, though, I'm making this analogy between the natural and the technological world. But in the natural world, you have to wait for mutations and millions of years for things to change. In the technological world, things change very quickly. And we could take the best of one game or a business element or a new technology and combine them in the ways that we've seen and create something fresh and new, something much like the World Wide Web that grew out of those old uh, pieces that I showed you before. And as soon as technology reached that point, where it was possible to have the World Wide Web, much like the Cambrian explosion, this whole panoply of, of new types of technology and new types of uses came out of nowhere. And I think we're at a similar point now with even more exciting possibilities, the ones that I've just talked about all coming together. So as I say, the World Wide Web was built on the fact that the internet was around, that we had better graphics cards in the computer and faster processors, and it all came together at just the right time. But the next thing is your own Games for Change evolutionary path. So where are we going? So I won't spend too much time on this because I'm really looking for you to create the future for the rest of us. And I'll give you a few suggestions of areas that I think are particularly promising uh, ingredients, if you will, that I think are either very wholesome or tasty or have a lot of potential for being combined in really fresh ways. One thing that's really critical for changing the world is how the world is so quickly growing to be completely connected. In just a few more years, there'll be another 5 billion people coming online. Many of those people already have feature phones, and they'll be getting smartphones. It just is inevitable. Uh, that's going to give you incredible power, uh, instant connection. And if you make games, if you make uh, tools that can run on low-end systems, then you're going to reach billions of people who are just coming online with those over the next few years who will be hungry for something new. And in many cases, will be in countries that could really use some extra help and some ways to advance. Uh, neuroscience and psychology, as I've mentioned, I think are incredibly important tools. I think we're going to see a lot more uh, of that two-way street where we can help them and they can help us. And I'm it, it, certainly, out of all the things that I was looking at as a freelancer that I'm most excited about, that's the one area that I think has the most potential. So in general, uh, again, it's a bit of a cliche, but you look for blue oceans. You look for these areas that have yet to be untapped. And often, new technology, to go back to the natural evolution thing, can be like a, an opening in a mountain range that opens up a whole new area. Maybe it's a very tiny area, and it turns out that after just a few years, a fad has come and gone, and nobody cares about that anymore. Sometimes it's a whole new continent, and it opens up, uh, like the World Wide Web did, some incredible things that no one could have imagined even just a few years earlier. It's important to be agile and iterative. Again, a bit of a cliche, but I've seen this over and over again through my career, that people who say, well, I've got a, a good long plan. It'll take a few years, but I know where it's all going to go, and we're just going to you know, execute to this plan and be unwavering and not change. That's almost always a recipe for disaster because this is such a rapidly changing world and because the technology changes so rapidly. You really need to be able to change with it. So combining the best of new technology and old proven knowledge, I mean, we've been playing games as a species for at least 11,000 years from archaeological evidence and probably much longer using you know, twigs and things that aren't uh, around anymore. 
some wonderful pictures that uh, I unfortunately wasn't able to get the rights to, and Google's pretty strict about not putting that sort of stuff up. Um, but take a look at old dice made from knuckle bones of animals. It's just amazing to see how long people have been playing games. And I'm going to leave you with the thought of don't bet against the internet. These phones that are coming online, the new smartphones, even the current feature phones, they're all connected. Connections are going to be happening more and more so that we'll all be uh, at some way or another connected to every other human being in the world. So started with an earlier Chinese uh, adage and You've probably heard, how many per people have heard about this as a, uh, an ancient Chinese curse? All right, a fair number. The fact is, interesting times, those are times of revolution, times of great change, and we are in interesting times right now. And it can be a curse, but as that other Chinese wisdom showed us, it sometimes can be another opportunity as well. So I think if you can combine all these different things and figure out ways to uh, take the strengths of what's best about things that have come before and what could be best about things coming into the future, then we can all create some amazing new games for change, and I'm looking forward to seeing what you're all going to do with it. So this is my contact information. Uh, I'm with a, a new group at Google called Fun Propulsion Labs, and until we can announce a little bit more of what we're doing, we're, we're keeping a little low, but uh, I'm happy to be in contact with people and feel free to connect with me on LinkedIn if you wish, but remind me of why because I get a lot of random uh, connections and I want to make sure there's some good reason for it. And that's it. Thanks very much.